The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leslie McGee with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to today's presentation, Championing Change with Positive Psychological Capital, being presented by Chris Dubel. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I would like to share a little bit of information about the APS TARC. We are a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide, please. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC. We work with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on the use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. We're here to help APS programs in any way we can, bottom line. Just reach out to us using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of this webinar. Next slide, please. The APS TARC works with the National Adult Protective Service Association, excuse me, or NAPSA, to present monthly peer-to-peer -peer calls. These calls provide a forum for workers, supervisors, and managers and administrators to dialogue and share ideas with each other about the issues and concerns facing APS programs today. The calls are held the second, third, or fourth Wednesday of each month, depending on which peer group you would want to attend. Registration information is sent via the APS listserv each month. Please email us if you are not a listserv member and would like to receive the registration information. Next slide, please. A copy of today's slides will be made available at a later date under the handout section in your GoToWebinar. I'm sorry, they are available today under the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel and can be downloaded from there. You may use computer audio or your phones to access audio for this webinar. We ask that you please mute your phones, headsets, or computer mics unless you are speaking so that we can eliminate any background noise. If you experience audio problems during the presentation, we recommend that you sign out of the webinar and re-enter. Next slide, please. This is intended to be an interactive webinar discussion, and there will be opportunities for questions during the presentation. However, if you prefer to submit your questions or comments in writing, you may type them in the questions box at any time during the presentation, and your question will be relayed to the speaker. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the web at a later date. We will notify all attendees via email when it is posted online. Everyone attending today will receive an email in approximately 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. Next slide, please. As I noted earlier, our speaker today is Chris Dubel, the Assistant Director of Training with Temple University Harrisburg. I am now going to turn this over to Chris and allow him to introduce himself. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It is great to be with you uh, this afternoon. I, I have a couple firsts going on right now. Um, I'm doing my first ever training during a tornado watch here in central Pennsylvania. And normally, if you've heard me train before, I put my dogs upstairs, but my smallest real little dog is really scared of thunderstorms. So she is literally standing right at my feet. So if there is a tornado and you see me and this little dog being swept up in the tornado, it is APS Targ's reenactment of Wizard of Oz. So I just wanted to let you know that ahead of time, that if the training's getting boring, we might just reenact Wizard of Oz. So it is great to be with you. I hope everybody is doing well. I would like to ask if um, you are able to just chat at me real quick as to just give me your first name and what state and maybe, maybe your position so I get a sense of who is on the call. So if I can get you to chat that, that would be fantastic. And Leslie, I'm not sure that I'm seeing everybody's chat. Is, is there okay. a? They are showing up in the Chris in the questions box, Chris. So I'll read it to you. Okay, um, perfect. We have Amber Moore from West Virginia, policy specialist. Oh, hi, Peg West Virginia Rod neighbors. Sorry, Peg Rogers, who's a manager from Colorado APS. Great. 
Tiffany Roper from uh, Texas, but she's an APS federal grant manager. Okay, great. Deb Swartz, APS deputy director, I'm sorry, from Kansas. Fantastic. Tyler Eli, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, from New York. Okay. Kelly Klein from the Adult Protective Services Unit in Minnesota. Elizabeth Paturi from ACL. Paturi, sorry, Elizabeth. Uh, Mary McGurn from Minnesota. Fantastic. Peter Hajmazi from Texas, a grant project manager. Rachel Lakin from New Hampshire. Maria Vasquez from Puerto Rico. Tamara Miller from Ohio. Uh, Taryn Lee Turgeon from Massachusetts. Ebony Phillips. Wow, my list just went wonky on me. Okay. Well, you gave me a nice sample. So if we've got a longer list, um, that's um, fantastic. Go ahead, Leslie. I was just like, we also have Louisiana, Idaho, and Perfect. another person who didn't identify their state. So, okay, Quite great. Wide so, representation. Yeah, great. So, we've got a lot of representation and, and diversity. And just a real quick uh, background about me. I'm, I'm so thankful that you're spending a few minutes this afternoon because this is a topic that I just love to talk about. I love to study. I love to try to put into my own practice at Temple University. And my portfolio uh, involves a lot of programs, all of our campuses, uh, continuing education and professional development contracts, but protective services is the passion for me. Uh, some of you know me and some of you know that I wake up in the morning thinking protective services. I first started uh, in protective services and working with your colleagues here in Pennsylvania and have had the opportunity to expand that across the country in 2002, um, close to 20 years now. And a colleague of mine recently asked me the question and said, hey, Chris, I." I've never seen you so excited about protective services. I've never seen you so charged up. What is it right now about protective services that has you so stoked and so ready to go? And I said to him, I said, because in my time, and then maybe those of you who have had a longer tenure have other moments, but in my time, in those 20 years, I've never experienced a time like this. This is an unprecedented moment. The resources, the attention that we're starting to get is just incredible and amazing. Uh, I remember my first uh, NAPSA conference, Andy was there and some others of you probably were there. And it was, it, it was in Orlando and I, full transparency here, I was sent there by Temple University to find out what products of ours we could get you to buy and we could sell you. And I remember coming back and talking to my directors after spending a week with all of you and, and meeting you and just finding out what was going on. And I remember saying, these folks ain't got no money. Like they share everything. Like they're bartering corn for curriculum. Okay, maybe it wasn't that bad. But there was that openness, there was that kind of, we just don't have many resources. Um, we're, we're just trying to do everything we can at the end of the day with very limited resources. And finally today, and this is what has me so excited, and I heard that we do have somebody on from ACL, and my big thanks go to ACL and the folks that we have over there that have worked really hard in to get this money into the places and onto the projects that it needs to be to benefit vulnerable older adults and adults with disabilities who are vulnerable to abuse, neglect, and exploitation. So I'm so appreciative and thankful for what they're doing. But this is just a Chris Dubel opinion, okay? And now Leslie's going, uh-oh, what's he gonna say? <laughs> With this moment that has me so excited and stoked, I also believe that myself and all of us who associate ourselves with adult protective services have an obligation. And that obligation is to move our field further and faster than ever before. To move our field further and faster than ever before. And that's gonna involve change. And that's why we're here to discuss change and what that looks like for you. 
And I'm gonna give you a statistic. I'm gonna start off with a statistic that is just gonna make you warm and fuzzy. Leslie, I'm warning you, after I give this statistic, everybody's gonna feel so empowered and excited. They're probably just gonna turn off the webinar and be like, I can do it now. That statistic is that no matter what field, from human services to corporate America, study after study finds that about 70%, seven out of 10 of all organizational change initiatives fail, and they fail badly. So you're going, okay, Chris, great, great, be a downer to start this. I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but I am trying to be realistic, because what I want us to do, what I want us to do in APS is stick that 70% number somewhere and go, that may be true, for the rest of the world, but in APS, we are going to do better. We're going to beat that number. Perfection is not possible. We're not gonna make all of our changes happen 100% of the time. We're actually gonna talk about that in some practical ways to move change, that perfection is not the standard. But we are gonna beat that 70%. And I know what I'm about to say is preaching to the choir. I know you already know this, but I also know that in my work, whether it be training, whether it be policy work, when I'm getting frustrated or I'm getting frustrated by the pace of change or that I can't get people to buy into a certain thing, I oftentimes forget what that change is for. And so what I want us to keep in mind as we spend a few minutes together today is that change at the end of the day is for older adults and adults with disabilities who are finding themselves vulnerable. Those people who are out there right now suffering in silence as we try to figure out how to do good remote assessments and remote investigations as the COVID spreads again. Those people who are out there right now who have experienced neglect and if they don't get effective protective service interventions very quickly, they're not gonna be with us that much longer. Those people that in the 45 minutes we have left on this webinar have people actively depleting their bank accounts. So we've got to take that 70% and say, we owe it to the people that we serve to do better than that. And so what I want to do today is I want to give you a concept, concept, a theoretical concept called psychological capital. And psychological capital has a lot of evidence for a lot of things. But one of the things that it has been shown to do is help with organizational change. And I'll give you some of the reasoning why I like psychological capital. Some of you may be already familiar with it from an organizational culture, organizational management, but it hasn't taken off like I think it should and like the research suggests it has evidence. But we're not gonna to stay too much at the theoretical level because you can Google. Like you can Google psychological capital, you can download the PowerPoint, uh, you can find that research, and you can certainly email me and I can share with you some of the research. At the end of the training and, and where we wanna spend most of our time is to try to give you some really practical things that come out of the research on psychological capital comes somewhat from my experience in talking with all of you and knowing uh, uh, the best that I can the field of protective services that you can implement today in your change process. And they're gonna be pretty practical. And many of them you're going to have all, are, are already doing. Some of them though, maybe it's something new or you really didn't think about it. Or if you're like me, I look at that list. I, I literally looked at the list an hour ago as a kind of last minute prepping and going, I don't know if I really should teach on this because I don't do that one real well. So there may be some also that you're like, oh, that is a good reminder that I need to double down in that area. So that's our plan because our goal is success. Our goal is whatever you have said that your change initiatives want to be through this project, as well as more and bigger picture, how do we get to have success? I do want to ask you a question though. And Leslie, I'm going to, there are our learning objectives just shared with what I want to do today. But Leslie, I'm going to have to ask you if you'll read the responses to this to us. 
think about a time where you were successful with a project. I know we've got lots of experience on this call, and it can be a project you did yourself at work, or a project that you led for your team, or even just some that you witnessed. What were the keys to that being successful? Give me a word or two or a sentence about what made that organizational change successful? Uh, we have good communication and buy-in listed so far. Great. Good communication and buy-in, Leslie? Mm hmm Fantastic. Collaboration and teamwork. Collaboration and teamwork. Excellent. Uh, buy-in from many partners, mainly because of recognition of common goal. So recognition oh, of I, the common goal is huge. I and, really, really like that. And that goes to what we're saying is that buy-in from multiple partners because of common goals, because of that end desire to do whatever that is and ultimately serve adults and older adults. Anything else coming in, Leslie? And we have a couple more. Excellent Great. leadership. Um, leadership. Did I hear leadership? Yes. Can you say that three times for me, Leslie? <laughs> leadership, leadership, leadership. Perfect, Leslie. Absolutely. We'll talk about this. In my opinion, leadership is absolutely critical to any change process. What else yeah. do we have? Uh, resources and facilitation and planning. Excellent. Uh, willingness to hear feedback. Oh, Every good. day, do 1% more. Every day, do 1% more. I like it. I like it. I so know. in 100 days, we got 100%, right? Is 100% more, exactly. I'm a social worker, Leslie, so <laughs> if, if my math is That's incorrect, math, now. let That's me know. So let me ask a different question. Okay. How about the challenges or the barriers that you all have seen or experienced when it comes to organizational change? The times where it's kind of fallen short. What would you attribute that to? Okay, I'm waiting on a couple of things to come in. Great. Uh, poor preparation or unilateral decision-making. What, what was that second one? I'm you, sorry, Leslie. Unilateral decision-making. Yes. Uh, lack of know more staff. about what they meant there. Me Go ahead. Too. Lack of staff or funds. Yep. Uh, people invested in maintaining what they have done as doing it differently may lead them to think they were doing it wrong. Oh, I like I that one. Who, who said that one? Thank you, Mary McGurn. Thank you, Mary McGurn. That is a good one. So let me make sure I got it. People kind of opposed to change because if they change and realize the change was the right way, they're also going to realize they've been doing it the wrong way for a long time. Mm -hmm. Ah, That's the way it. very um, good, very good. Love a it. A couple of comments about senior management not recognizing the uh, importance of it or getting decision, um, getting yeah. input. I'm sorry from the experts. Bureaucracy, yeah. right in line with that one. No investment beyond the kind behind the concept. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, again, lack of leadership or inability to see the benefits of the change. Yeah, um, I was I was going to share this statistic later, but I'm going to share it now because you just have had a theme of things that remind me of this statistic. They did a recent. They did. They pulled a few studies together that totaled about seventy-nine thousand employees across different workforces. Fit only fifteen percent of workers in this study said that they understood the leader's vision for change. Only fifteen percent said they understood the leader's vision for change. And I think about that in my own life, like. To everybody that said about communication and leadership and connection and participation and all of those types of things, I think it's absolutely critical. What else did you have, Leslie? Were there other things? Um, there were a couple more. Okay. Um, a lack of understanding of the resources needed, seeing yep. the big picture, 
And, um, oh, there was one I, I missed before. No, I'm sorry. I think I did cover them all. That's great. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. That is really helpful. And I'm going to try to come back to some of those comments and, and touch on them as we go. Uh, if you've heard me train before, you know I love to be interactive and I love to have a lot of discussion. But we do want to we want to stay on a time frame both for your schedules and the next band of storms here in Pennsylvania is coming through right around four o'clock. So. But we want to talk about how do we go from where we're at to producing success. Traditionally, we have viewed capital, and oftentimes in human services and nonprofits, we don't talk a lot about capital. We use other terms, but they tend to mean the same thing. We traditionally have looked at three forms of capital. Economic capital, which is, which is those resources, finances, tangible assets, funding, as we talked about. Social capital is kind of who we know, the relationships we have, very important, very critical in being able to do our work in human services and APS. And then human capital, what we know, experience, education, skills, knowledge, and ideas. And for years and years, if you look at the history of studying organizational change, most studies, most research focused only on one of those three. But what's interesting, and if you said resources, resources are critical, so all of them are important. But when you break down that 70%, researchers have looked at that 70% and said, okay, what's causing that 70% failure? 14% of the time, it's, it's because of what they classify as other reasons. There's change or there's other leadership directives or that type of thing. They're just kind of in an other category. Another 14% of the time, it is because of economic capital particularly and even human capital. The resources aren't there. The resources um, aren't available to apply to the project. But what's really interesting, and you all have hit it already in kind of why you describe being successful as well as the challenges. 39% of the time, it was because staff didn't buy in. 39% staff didn't buy in. 33%, the rest of it, 33% was because management didn't do what was necessary to support change. And I'm going to hit this home over and over again. The role of management, leadership, supervisors in change. Because what the research suggests, what I fully believe, is that if we got management to better support change, that number of staff that are resistant to change is going to drop significantly. And so in the early 2000s, he started to say, okay, these things make up a part of why change doesn't happen, but what about the people aspect of why change isn't occurring? And you see just this shutterstock image of a, of a group of people, of headshots on your screen. But I want you to kind of do me a visualization exercise and help me out here. I want you to look at this and not see the shutterstock image. I want, to see, I want you to see your teams. I want you to see the folks at the front line that are going to have to buy into this change. Maybe the people above you that are going to have to buy into this change. Because psychological capital says we need to address them. And that study that I mentioned earlier of the 79,000 staff, a couple more statistics from it. One was that 15% didn't have any idea what their leaders were thinking when it came to the innovation. Only 28%, basically one out of four, said they like taking risks. So that means three out of four of, from this survey, doesn't mean it applies to your teams, but think about your teams, only three out of four really wanna be risk takers at work. One out of four don't. 
and the one that really is alarming to me from this survey when it comes to organizational change is that only 15 percent of workers say that during organizational change they feel comfortable sharing the challenges that they are experiencing with management that is i mean it's less than eight out of or two out of ten less than two out of ten that's more than that's eight out of ten people that are aren't going to bring up the challenges that they're experiencing during a change process one of you and we didn't get the names one of you said feedback and that constant feedback and that is where it is so important and we'll touch on that here very shortly but again think through your teams think through who's there think through do those statistics resonate or do those statistics they don't sound like your team because what psychological capital and what a lot of the organizational change says we've got to cultivate a culture that's ready to change and that culture may not be there currently and we'll we'll talk about that specifically with protective services in just a moment so enter psychological capital if you're curious um and i should have put this in the slide the the author the creator of psychological capital is a gentleman by the name of fred luthans it's spelled l-u-t-h-a-n-s if you're interested in googling uh his work a lot of people have studied this since and have found again there's change there's dealing with stress actually the training i do on burnout and stress is all based around an organizational culture perspective on psychological capital so it has a lot of effectiveness in a lot of areas the key to psychological capital versus the other capitals that we talked about is psychological capital is considered state-like versus trait-like and what that means is things that are state-like we can adapt we can develop we can change we can do things differently trait-like things either have a cap to them or they progress very slowly for example under human capital knowledge is oftentimes talked about and a trainer should never ever say what i'm about to say knowledge is most of the time capped for a lot of us our working and our active memory can only hold so much now i'm not saying we shouldn't do training we absolutely should but it doesn't it, it's not an endless thing it doesn't it doesn't change very quickly either does experience and as someone just as someone said i think it was mary said um like sometimes that experience has been doing they say experience is the best teacher but sometimes experience teaches us to be doing the wrong things and handling things the wrong way and so those things tend to be capped. And that's why a lot of people like psychological capital because there's something we can do about it. There are policy, there are supervisory ways, there are, there's training, there's development, there's coaching that we can do to improve the four constructs of psychological capital, which are hope, confidence, self-efficacy, if you like fancy words, I like just going with confidence, hope, confidence, optimism and resiliency let me define very quickly for you each of those four constructs because they might be a little different than you're used to hearing at least with some of the words hope is not oh i hope that this project just goes perfectly there are no hassles there are no roadblocks i hope that there's never ever a protective service case that goes bad ever again I hope that ACL tomorrow gives us a billion dollars. Hint, hint, the person with ACL. No, it's hope is not that. Hope is not a pie in the sky type thing. Hope, when it comes to organizational change and psychological capital, is based around goals and pathways to get to those goals. Psychological capital, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes, demands that you have clear goals, but sometimes what we forget to do is provide for our teams, provide for the people that need to make that change, the clear pathways to do it. 
so if I um, have a goal, but I'm afraid that if I do something or something else slips up, a supervisor's gonna jump down my throat, I'm gonna get written up, those types of things, that's not a clear pathway to get there. So hope and psychological capital says every goal that we have has to have at least one clear pathway in order to get there. The next concept is confidence. And I think most of you on this call are in administration somehow. So you know the feeling that's depicted in this picture where you feel like you're sitting on a really small branch with a lot of weight on that branch. And you're just praying that 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 keeps up. But in this picture, that elephant looks confident, right? Confidence in psychological capital is very similar to the word we use, self-efficacy. It is that we believe that we can successfully implement the action to be successful on a specific task. And I'll dive into that a little bit more with some specific examples. But it, sometimes it depends on the day of the week that you ask me whether I'm effective at organizing change or not. On a Tuesday, I'm going to be like, yeah, I'm really good at this because look at how my team's doing. And then Wednesday, I have a meeting with my team where they're ready to like basically kick me off the island. And I'm like, oh, I'm terrible at this. But that confidence is that ability to have a specific task and knowing that I can implement that. The next one, and I'm gonna come back to this picture. The next one is optimism. And optimism is interesting in psychological capital because it's not the glass is always half full. Optimism in psychological capital is when good things happen, when I achieve positive outcomes, they are because of my skills, my talents, my abilities, who I am that when a si similar situation happens, I can apply those same skills, abilities, and talents and get a similar positive outcome. But optimism also recognizes that bad things happen, negative outcomes happen. But I can still be optimistic even about negative outcomes when I view those negative outcomes as things that are not because of my skills, talents, and abilities, or not because of the inner core of who I am, but because of external things that if I change next time, if I get a little more training on motivational interviewing, or I get a little more training on how to do organizational change or supervision or those types of things, that the next time I face a similar situation that went bad, I can do it well. That's optimism. And that's why I think this example is just really good. Uh, probably most of you know this example. That is Steve Harvey. That is Steve Harvey announcing the Miss Universe contest. And that is Steve Harvey announcing the wrong winner of the Miss Universe contest. I'm gonna suspect that this is one of the lowest moments of Steve Harvey's career. I don't know Steve Harvey, so I don't know this for sure, but I'm gonna expect that this is. Anybody know what he did the following year? He hosted the Miss Universe contest again. Because from an optimism standpoint, Steve Harvey, I'm gonna speculate, said, yeah, this isn't because of my talent, my abilities as an entertainer. This is because of external reasons. Maybe I got a bad card. Maybe I didn't read it. Maybe I read it too quickly. Maybe, I, and next year I can do differently because I can make the changes necessary to be successful. That's optimism under psychological capital. The fourth construct is resiliency. And Leslie, I would like you, I'd like you to read a couple of the responses that you get. You see this little girl on the screen on a tricycle. She is about to fall over, or this little child, sorry. I am I, I, Something I'm working on is being more gender neutral in my language. So this child uh, um, on the tricycle and about to fall over, and it's not gonna be a real big fall, right? Like nothing real bad's gonna happen. Maybe gonna scrape the knee a little bit. What's this child going to do first when, the, and chat this to me, what's this child going to do first when they fall or after they fall? Leslie, what are some of the answers of what this child is going to do first? 
Okay, we're gonna wait. Give people a couple seconds to get in okay. there. Look for mommy. Oh, <laughs> they hit it. Who was that, Leslie? Thank you, Lisa Amador. Thank, thank um, you. Thank, nope, that look, that's the perfect answer, Leslie. <laughs> Lisa, Lisa got it exactly right. They are gonna look up, right? Mm -hmm. And they are gonna look around to see the parents' reactions. Yep. Yeah, two very similar yep. answers. Good. Try and look for comfort and look to an adult yep. reaction. So right in the same line. This is happening in our organizations constantly, not just with change, but just across the board. People, when they make mistakes and they're going to make mistakes, are going to look up and look around, right? They're going to look at what that reaction, if that reaction is, oh, I can't believe you did this, they're gonna start crying. I mean, not necessarily literally crying, but they're gonna to start to feel really bad. They're gonna to start to feel that hurt. If that reaction is, yeah, you screwed up. That's, that, this, this is not what we meant by change. So come on, let's go. Let's figure this out. Different reaction, right? One promotes resiliency, the other doesn't. And I'm gonna give you some specific things to look out for with resiliency. But resiliency is the ability to bounce back from change. Sometimes even positive change. Sometimes when we think of change, we only think of people having a negative reaction, but even positive change, the work and the progress and the increased responsibility can be overwhelming for us. So that resiliency. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over this, these first slides on each of the constructs. You can download them on how you just generally, kind of the base principles of how you develop each construct. What I wanna do though, is I wanna spend some time on the specific. I wanna give you three ways in each of these areas that you can work on increasing them. Again, this comes from the literature. This comes from the research about organizational change, about psychological capital. And some of it comes a little bit from just my knowledge of what goes on in protective services. Many of these things you do already, great. Many of these things, or some of these things you may not do, or you just may be like, oh, I don't do that as often as I want. But what we know from the literature, what we know from experience is these things are critical to producing in a very practical way that high level of psychological capital, that high level of hope in the case of this slide to help us produce change. We talked about this, setting goals that clearly provide pathways to meet them. A number of you in the interaction talked about leadership. This is an opinion um, that I can back up. I don't necessarily need you to subscribe to it, but I just wanna throw it out there. It is my belief that leaders set goals, but leaders stay out of the way of development of pathways. And then leaders come back once those pathways are developed and make sure that they're put into place. Some of you are going to go, well, I thought we were supposed to participate. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that you close the voice to what other goals should be. But ultimately, you all as leaders, the people that are in leadership, have a responsibility to set vision and set goals. But I will say from my own experience, and maybe I'm just throwing myself under the bus, it is most of the time my team that has a much better way, idea of how to get there, pathways. But I will tell you, this is one I'm not very good at because I kind of think I know. I kind of think, I, oh, I, I know how to do this. And I'll start to set the pathways for people. And every time I do that, I see people just turning off. And many times when I let them do it, <laughs> let them do it, they come back with the same pathways that I would have had. But I have noticed, I didn't do it in a controlled study, but I have noticed at least anecdotally, when I let people, when I have people, when I have my team have a clear vision of what I want, with clear vision of my goals, that they can develop those pathways, there is a lot more ownership of those things than if I don't. Number two is, a, this is added, this does not come from the literature, so to speak, on psychological capital. It does though borrow from your classic Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You remember that in Psych 101? 
but I think it is really critical as I've talked with your teams and I've talked with numerous protective service investigators across the country, there needs to be a commitment to basic safety. I'm gonna focus on in the field at the moment, I'm gonna, but this also includes in the workplace, but we'll talk about toxic workplace under resiliency, but you could put it here as well. There needs to be a commitment to basic safety. Every change that we need make needs to be put in the context of how might this affect an investigator's safety in the field. You all have been dealing with this and thank you. Thank you for all your hard work during COVID. Uh, I sometimes say nurses and doctors are getting all the credit and I know that they should, but we're not giving APS enough credit for how the work that they're doing. But I talk with investigators and you know, this is a difficult time. This is a challenging time to be putting change in place because their first priority, their commitment is not only keeping themselves safe, but not taking something back to their families, keeping the people around them safe. And many times if I ask that question, they're gonna say keeping the older adults, the adults with disabilities that they serve safe. So if in any of your change process, there is a safety element to it, I'm gonna really encourage you to address that head on and early because if you don't, you're going to see that resistance. Recognize and address relationships between personnel uh, critical to change. There's a little concept, and if we had more time, we could go through it a little bit in, in deeper, is where you take your organizational chart. You pull that organizational chart with all your FTEs on it, and you remember, those of you who did social work, the genograms and how you were supposed to connect family members, and you'd put like a dotted line if the relationship wasn't good, you put a solid line if the relationship was good and the relationship was broken, like you had the little symbols. If you know what I mean by a genogram, apply that to the organizational chart. There's a little mapping exercise that you can do where you take your organizational chart prior to implementing change and you go, okay, what are the relationships between people? Who is it that I need to get the buy-in from that's going to make the biggest difference in me getting the buy-in from the rest of my staff? And don't necessarily think in hierarchy. Prior to protective services, I managed a large social work department here in, in central Pennsylvania. We had about 35 social workers and another 25 nurses who did discharge planning. You know who my number one critical person was when I did a change initiative? It was our administrative assistant. Because I knew if Lucy was bought in, everybody was coming to Lucy to say, ah, what's Chris thinking? What are we doing? Like, and Lucy would be like, well, I think it's a good idea. Now, Lucy wasn't even doing social work. She wasn't even doing discharge planning. But I knew if Lucy said, oh, I think, I think it's a good idea. I think it could help people. It was going to get people to stop and think. There were other people, though, that I knew I couldn't have on the same team. Or if I had on the same committee, I was going to have some challenges. Sometimes we do committees by just who volunteers versus who can work effectively together? Not that they always have to agree with everything each other say. I want some difference of opinion, but who can truly collaborate? Who can truly work as a team? Think through that a little bit as you plan your, your change process and who's gonna be there, where you're gonna go for that buy-in, as well as who you're going to assign to what. Development of confidence. Again, general principles here. The three ways to increase confidence during change. And I, I don't know who said it, but you said it well. Feedback all of the time. Invite that formal and informal feedback and make sure we're responding to that information. The research is clear. My experience is clear. Probably your experience is clear as well. The worst thing that can happen when we give feedback is to get silence back or to get an email that doesn't perfectly describe our feedback back from us. A colleague of mine here, my assistant director for our Institute on Protective Services, Richard Albrecht, talks when he does supervisor training, talks about uh, walking supervision. 
if we want to do change effectively, we've got to get out there. And I don't know if you're a supervisor, a mid-level manager, director, administrator. We need to get our get away from our desk and go talk to people about how it's going. Yes, we need to have the meetings where formally people speak. But are we also grabbing one of our investigators and just saying, how's this going for you? How is it working? I want your honest feedback. Remember, only 15% of employees, of workers, feel like they can share the challenges that they're having. I'm going to speculate that a lot of that is because they're just never being asked in an informal way. It's just in a formal meeting where they feel that pressure. So making sure that we do that. Matching skill level to tasks re required for change. Remember that self-efficacy part. Thinking through, what do you need to do? I'm gonna guess, just a speculation, and Leslie, you don't have to tell me, but if somebody wants to chat anonymously that this is them, that is fine. I'm gonna guess some of you prior to this position never wrote a grant in your life. And uh, don't, you know, you're still not confident about your abilities to write a grant. Thank goodness you got it. But you're like, I don't know if it was any good or not. Many of us have worked our ways up, myself included, because we were pretty decent at what we did on the ground level. Not because we got a lot of courses in grant writing or organizational change management or, you know, we've got a few MBAs floating around administration and APS, but we don't have a ton. Making sure that we match the skills to the tasks required. If you need a champion, make sure that person truly has the personality to be a champion. If you need that technical person to be reviewing uh, curriculum, and again, I don't know what all your projects are, but reviewing policy, make sure we're, we're doing that. This third one relates, and it's a little bit different as well, and it's why this picture of the cat standing by the birdhouse is, is sometimes we have a tendency to go to the same people every single time when we need the bulk of the work done and we burn our champions out. We burn out the people who would be willing to volunteer and who would be very effective at it because they know if they stick their hand up, there's a lot of work coming. And I would love to tell you that I never do this, but just yesterday, I was talking to one of my team about a change thing that we had to do. And she said to me, she said, basically, Chris, you're saying my job just got 10% more work. And the people that aren't up to it, they're, they're not having to do as much as I'm doing just because I have this skill set. I was like, you're right. You're right. I was working on burning out my champion. I was working on burning out that person. And it's natural because I know I can depend on her. I know I can depend on her commitment to the project. We have to be careful about doing that. Development of optimism. We need to have positive, realistic, and measurable outcome expectations. Now, if you've ever been part of this, I had this experience recently with a, with a grant that was written for me that the expectations were way too high and they were unachievable. And from the moment I started that grant to the moment I ended it, I hated every moment of it and I felt so disempowered because I knew we couldn't get there. Thinking about those realistic and measurable outcome expectations. And some of you might be thinking, ooh, because we all do it. We all shoot for the skies in our grant applications. But was that realistic? Is that a realistic outcome? And no, you cannot go to ACL and say, Chris Dubel said we could modify our goals. No, that, well, you won't get away with that. But I would say, think about how you're passing on those goals to your teams. Does it feel achievable? Because if it doesn't feel achievable, they're most likely not, the, the motivation stops before it gets started. So even if I'm just making up a number, even if you set a certain goal at 40% over the next two years, make sure you're not just saying, okay, we got to improve by 40%. Make that measurable to people. Make that achievable to people. And I am a huge fan of dashboards when it comes to change. Making information and data available to people on a constant basis 
whether we're doing well at something, whether we're doing okay at something, or we're not doing well at all. Spend majority of energy on gaining buy-in of supervisors and managers to provide support necessary to staff. I alluded to this earlier. Your managers and supervisors are critical to modeling the change that is necessary. If you do not have their buy-in, the likelihood that that is going to move from an organizational culture perspective down to frontline staff, very, very unlikely. So as leaders, as administrators, as champions of your change, spend your effort, spend your energy on those supervisors and managers. Number three is accept and demand responsibility by everyone for the good, the bad, and the ugly. Some of you know this person, Joe Snyder, used to be the director of Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, very active in uh, policy work for protective services. Joe uh, has been a mentor for me, um, and Joe has a saying that says, what one of us does in protective services, all of us do. And what all of us do in protective services, one of us does. It has to be that mentality. If leaders, as leaders, if we've screwed up, if we've missed something, we've got to step out. Because what that's going to say, remember optimism, is about saying, okay, we've, we've missed some things here, but this is what we're going to change. This is what we're going to do differently. So when we face this situation again, when we continue to confront the goals of this grant, we can still be optimistic about it. Resiliency, expect and embrace failure as learning. I don't have time to dig into this too far, so I probably shouldn't even mention it, but I will anyway. We have this thing in APS where we almost have this implied expectation of perfection. And the moment we miss, the moment we fall short, and we've got people's lives on the other hand, on our hands, so it's hard not to have this. But there's always going to be a margin for error. And when we do fail to produce resiliency, we've got to take that, we've got to acknowledge it. We don't ignore it. This is not, a, we don't have failures here. We only have opportunities for improvement. It's not that concept. It's like, no, we screwed up here and what, can we learn from this? Whether it be change management or all of APS, root cause analysis, thinking through what's the root that's getting in the way of our change? Demanding a solution focus. I find that in change management, and I get tempted by this too, is we spend a lot of time letting people take over meetings that are just, they were resistant to change the moment they came out of their mother's womb. Like they were the ones going, oh, I, this is this is the, absolutely the wrong day. I wasn't supposed to be born this day. I was really comfortable. I wasn't prepared. Like, you know, these people in your organization, those people that no matter what you do, they are going to throw obstacles at you. Here's what I want you to say back to them. Okay, what's your solution? But, okay, what's your solution? Okay, what's your solution? Demand that solution focus. It doesn't mean that we don't hear the voices of the people who are legitimately trying to grasp something or understand why we're doing something, but particularly for those people that aren't going, because there are going to be certain people that are just never going to adjust to change. Flip it back on them. Demand that solution focus. Last one on here, and I do want to spend just a couple minutes opening it up for questions, and I can stay on longer if uh, Leslie wants me to is we've got to end toxic workplace behavior. If you want to look at some interesting stuff, and unfortunately it's sad stuff, the rate of workplace violence, workplace bullying, gossip in human services is absolutely terrible and horrendous. If I feel like if I make a mistake during the change process, people are going to talk about me and not be solution focused, they're going to gossip, or even worse, I'm going to get yelled at, I'm going to get chastised, I'm going to be demeaned. Change isn't going to happen because that's going to set that model for resiliency. So not only will that person affected be scared to speak up, be scared to share the challenges that they have or the things that, that didn't go well, but everybody else is going to see that as well. 
So that was a crash course. And, and Leslie, I see I tried to give about five minutes here. That was a crash course on psychological capital. Um, and I'm happy to discuss this with anyone. And, and no, I won't try to sell you anything um, from Temple. But I'm happy my, my, my email, and I forgot to say just the role of leaders uh, on this next slide. It's just critical. All of you are critical to that change process. Uh, in the PowerPoint is my email. I'm just happy. I love discussing this stuff. And we're a Zoom call away or, or a go to webinar call away, a go to meeting call to, to just have some of how some of this stuff can apply to your change process. I hope there were some practical suggestions there that will be valuable uh, to you as you go about this important work. Leslie, were there any questions that came in? I know we went, kind of did that crash course. Yes, we did go through quite a bit pretty quick, Chris, but um, there was one request for you to give the reference that you mentioned earlier again. Yeah, sure. It's Fred Luthens, and it's L-U-T-H-A-N-S. You do have a compliment that I'd like to share. That thank you, and this was very interesting. Well, good, and 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 thanks for to my grandmother for participating. I'm I'm <laughs> glad she I'm glad she found it useful. Okay, I at this point do not see any other questions coming through. Um, so I oh great as always another compliment. Okay, Aloha. thank you. Oh, Aloha. <laughs> my friends in Hawaii. I know I have a terrible job. I got to spend a week with my friends in Hawaii doing training. It was uh, awful. I can only imagine. I would <laughs> like to uh, experience that myself. Next what time you're own? coming with me, Leslie, we'll, we'll angle for an invitation. Okay. And we'll go with that. Actually, we don't have many questions, Chris, but we do have several uh, notes of appreciation. Okay. Um, excellent speaker. Thank you very much. This is one um, so timely as it is time for change in APS and some big ways to improve person centered, not investigative centered outcomes and oh. to really look deeply at equity in the system and services and how culturally informed we are in this reporting and response processes. So that was a, who, a very nice who, comment. Do you mind sharing who said that? I, unless they said um, it. No, Mary McCurran offered that. Mary so. again, uh, Mary, I, I think that is just a, such an excellent point. Um, you know, you heard, whoops, you heard me catch myself in the use of, of gender neutral language and and just diversity and culture across the board and, 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 and staying focused on that and all of the change that we do. Um, law enforcement's not the only group that has implicit bias. Um, anytime that we stick in the role of authority over people, we need to be confronted. And I know we don't think about ourselves that way, um, but at some level we do have authority in APS and we need to confront those, those issues of, of, of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, you name it. I just think it's, it, it's really, really important. And so thank you for that comment. I, it was a great addition to what we talked about. Okay. Um, again, several comments appreciate of appreciation and thank you for a great presentation from a great presenter. So, yeah, well, thank, uh, and thank you everybody well for kind of what you do. And, and again, if I can be a support, uh, um, I, uh, I would love to love to support you again. We can just have a conversation, Zoom call um, and, and appreciate everything everybody is doing. Okay, can you just go real quick to the last slide for me, please? Oh, absolutely. Okay, I want to thank everyone along with Chris for your attention today and for attending the this presentation. I think it was an excellent uh, source of information and I appreciate it, Chris. If yeah, you have you. any questions or would like any assistance from the APS TARC, our contact information is on the screen. And again, you will uh, receive a certificate of attendance and request for evaluation shortly after this presentation and we will notify you all when it is available when the recording is available thank you and have a very good afternoon thank you everybody bye bye
Leslie, you still on? Hey, Andy, can you hear me? 